What's pop me all? Lately, Drake's post beef success or lack thereof has been under fire, particularly the singles that have been dropping flopping, as some might say. I'm willing to agree if we define flopping as Drake not charting as high as he should or how high he used to, even with random loose songs. And people are saying, oh, Drake fell off, especially with the news with Kendrick Lamar doing the whole NFL thing. And let's just take a quick look at the singles that have been released by Drake with Drake as a leading artist in the past couple of weeks, if not months. So we had the song No Face, which is a more recent one. That's debuted at number 60. Circadian Rhythm, that debuted at 69. We had It's Up, which was with 21 Savage and Young Thug. That debuted and peaked at number 28. It's still on the charts, but it's consistently fallen. Blue, Green, Red debuted and peaked at number 63, but that was only on the charts for a week. And in part, that's because it was taken down from streaming platforms. We don't really have any updates on that. And then there's Housekeeping Knows with Lotto, which debuted and peaked at number 85. That's no longer on the charts right now. So the only current songs on the charts for Drake are the following. No Face, which is the highest charting one right now. Circadian Rhythm, which is we just talked about, It's Up at 74, and You My Everything with Sexy Red. So these aren't great chart positions. Now, I do think context matters a lot because a lot of people will just use this at face value if they have an axe to grind with Drake or want to make Kendrick Lamar look better. But that's not what we're here to do. We're here to be honest. We're here to be fair. And I'm really liking what Drake's been doing as of late. But first, we have to rewind to the end of the beef to see what's been happening afterwards. So what spawned the end of the beef was Drake was dropping Family Matters. He dropped a music video for the song Family Matters. It had a beat switch. The reception was going to be great. The reception was still great. A lot of people appreciate that song, think it's a great song. I'm one of those people. I just don't think it hit commercially. And some people say that, oh, this was the best song of the whole beef. Well, why didn't that reflect in the streaming numbers? Because it's got, what, 100 million? Not Like Us has nearly 800 million now, just on Spotify numbers we're talking about. So is, are they going to say they bought it eight times the numbers? Come on, let's be fair here. And if that song was so good, Drake is so much more commercially popular than Kendrick Lamar. Maybe not during this beef, but historically. So he should be streamed more or at least come close to matching up to Not Like Us on the charts, which we didn't see from Family Matters. And in part, this was because of Kendrick Lamar's strategy. So Kendrick Lamar's release of Not Like Us during academic stream overshadowed Family Matters. It stifled it. And not only was it the song being released, but it was the type of song that was released. I mean, Meet the Grams, but he dropped Not Like Us right after Meet the Grams the next morning. So I always confuse the two. I may say Not Like Us instead of Meet the Grams. They're just so closely knit and tied up that I frequently make this error. So yeah, Meet the Grams dropped the same while Academics was live. So Not Like Us became a hit that was more of a club banger. Before those songs, we had gotten, what, 616, we had gotten Meet the Grams, we had gotten Euphoria, not in any particular order, or I'm not listing them in order. But none of those songs were really songs that could top the charts in a way that would be comparable to Drake in that they would sustain their chart positions at the top for a long time. They all charted very high, but that's because of the hype surrounding the beef. Not Like Us is still a chart topper. So this song ended up being a club record, and and the timing of the song, people dancing to it, it being a cultural moment. And this is usually Drake's strength. So it really toppled Drake because he beat him from his own angle. So Drake's response to this was the heart part six, where he was mainly just addressing a lot of these. He was forced into a defensive position because you've got bars like A minor, you know, certified PDF. Like These are really scathing accusations. And the problem is they stuck. The Heart Part 6, while it was a good song, it didn't stick. It just felt like a defeat. It felt like he was calling everything off. And this is what happened. Kendrick Lamar didn't reply to this after. Also, we have to make note that during, while this is all going on towards the end of the beef, Drake's security guard gets shot outside of his home in Toronto, Canada, $100 million home right in front of it. We don't know what personal issues Drake has behind the scenes that were adding to stress towards the end of this beef. Maybe he decided, hey, I need to focus on some other things because we haven't heard about that shooting incident since. We haven't heard of any developments. We haven't heard of any arrests. We haven't even heard of any rumors. It's almost like that was just people just washed their hands of it and moved on. So I don't know what the Canadian police are doing with that. And then Kendrick Lamar's really low-key, the A minor rumors going crazy, 
low-key damaging Drake's reputation. And if we're being fair here, like I said, is the spirit of not only this video, but this entire channel, there's really no solid proof of that. Sure, we can't say that they're baseless because someone that wants to look at things negatively and if they position it the right way, they could take a couple of those clips and incidents and say, oh yeah, you know, that looks weird. Sure, that looks weird if it's interpreted from a certain lens, but that's not to say that what Kendrick Lamar is accusing Drake of is true. And I will also be honest in that Drake invited some of this. He made sure that all gloves were taken off when he mentioned Kendrick Lamar's family, in particular his wife, longtime girlfriend. We're going to call her his wife. They don't have to be married. In my eyes, that's his wife. So this left Drake in an interesting position. And your post beef options are one of two things. You can either take some time off, cool off, and come back. And in this case, with Drake, there's a lot of expectation because you're at the top of the game. If you're a lower level rapper, a mid tier rapper, even a B tier rapper, people don't expect you to come back with hits. You could cool off, come back, people forgot the beef. Let's just take Chris Brown and Quavo as an example. They had their little run in with the beef, which happened during this, which didn't get too much attention after. Nobody really remembers it that much. Chris Brown really, really cooked Quavo. Quavo tried to come back at him, which was all in good fun. I enjoyed that moment. But if Quavo were to drop now, nobody has this expectation of him having to drop a hit because he's recovering from the Chris Brown beef. It's just going to be received like any other song on a clean slate, balanced perspective and expectation. However, with Drake, when you're the biggest rapper in the game, there's going to be a high expectation of what you come back with, especially when Drake is not known to take months off just cooling or working on something. We usually get updates periodically, whether it's via Instagram stories, different, not leaks, but snippets here and there, or different outlets putting out messages for Drake, be it a streamer, be it Yachty, be it academics, whatever the case may be. But Drake decides to do the only other option, which is to just keep not flooding the streets, but keep people on their toes and expecting new things. There were some odd moves made here. So the first song that comes out May, towards the end of May, was You My Everything. It was a Sexy Red song. Drake's been cool with Sexy Red. And this song sucked. Let's be real here. This didn't suck because of Drake, but it sucked because of Sexy Red. And the ironic thing is, Drake's verse was good on here. A lot of people appreciated the verse, the ones that weren't just complete outright haters, but him being on a song that garbage, that we unanimously, I would say almost unanimously, thought was garbage, was an embarrassment. Yet, that song, funny enough, is still charting. Now, it's at 88 on the chart. Its peak position was number 44. It never cracked the top 40, but it's been going up and down, up and down, still holding on to its chart position for 15 weeks. That's almost four months. So this song has been doing well. It's been performing well. So I guess we were wrong here. Now, this isn't a chart topper, but it's still up there. It's still holding its own. So were we wrong here? Were we not? I don't know. But at the time, this did not look good. They were like, yo, what the hell? Drake, why are you on here? Why is the first thing that you're doing a sexy red song? What the hell? After this, though, another funny moment happens. About a month later, we get this song, Wagwan Delilah by Snow Day, which isn't even a real artist, as far as I know, at, up until that moment, which was a remix of Hey There Delilah with this Jamaican slash Toronto accent. It was a meme, but this is another embarrassing moment. Regardless of it being a meme, people were saying, yo, this is not a real song. The Drake Defenders, the nation of Drizzlov, they were saying, oh man, this is not a real song. You can't judge them off this, but coming after the Sexy Red song, that sucked. And then you have this song, people are like, what the hell is going on? Like this does, it does not look good. And I was in agreement there. What the hell is Drake doing? In June, he had appearances on two Camila Cabello songs. One was entirely a Drake voice slash track on her album. This was somewhat used as an interlude. I thought it was good, but keep in mind the context. This is one of the first things that Drake is coming back with. And even his biggest fan, Academics, was looking at him like, yo, Drake, are you what's going on here? Why are you even here? Why are you dropping on here? And looking back, yeah, this song, I enjoy the song listening to it right now, even though it was used as an interlude. But contextually, it's almost as if, whoa, what's going on here? And he said he was on his summer vibes. But the other song that he was on was Hot Uptown, which he gave her a feature. And this one was more of a song that they made trying to do something. And we also got to give credit to Drake here. He didn't hold off on any of the features, including the ones that we're going to talk about, that he promised these people. He cleared these. He could have said, yo, this cannot go out. But he decided to let them go out. This Hot Uptown song, it wasn't no rapping on here. I can tell you that. Camila Cabello... It's more of a singy type song, more of a pop type song, but Drake is in his 
Caribbean bag here. I don't know if he's on that Patois, whatever Caribbean dialect or language or whatever it's called, that he, slang that he's using on here. It's it's a cool song, but it didn't do crazy numbers. And at the time, I said we couldn't judge it right away because Camila Cabello songs, they usually take some time to chart if they want to work the record, but that didn't happen. So time has elapsed. It's been a couple of months now and we can judge it. Yeah, this song ended up being a dud. It didn't do too hot. The best performing song on that entire project ended up being the song that she had with Playboy Cardi, I Love It, which has got over 110 million streams. So that was the first release. And Drake was getting some criticism like, yo, this guy, Kendrick really watched this guy. He stopped, he stopped him from rapping. He sent him to pop now. Okay. After this, though, what did we get next? We got July, which July he appeared on two tracks on Gordo's album, Diamante. Sideways, which has been performing decently well, but this is a completely different vibe. This isn't really hip hop. This is more dance slash house music. I like the song Sideways. He was also on the song Healing. People, I would say, generally didn't really pay too much attention to these releases within hip hop. They didn't get as much talk as the Camila Cabello, as the Snow Day or as the Sexy Red releases. But at this point, we've gotten a bunch from Drake in the two months. He didn't drop anything himself, which would come to change once we got to August, but he was peppering features here and there. He was letting these people clear these feet, or he was allowing these people to release these features. He was clearing them and he was letting them release. And people were making their comments. This leads up to the 100 Gigs project. So Drake releases this project called 100 Gigs, which isn't an album, it's not an EP, although it has that name just for Spotify purposes. But it was on his Instagram page, he had this new private Instagram page, this Finsta, where he released 100 gigs of data, which had behind the scenes clips throughout his career. I mean, tour rehearsals, studio footage, and he dropped these three songs initially on his Instagram through Reels. And at that time, the songs were It's Up, it was also 21 Savage, yeah, that was 21 Savage one. And people thought that 21 Savage was dissing Kendrick Lamar, but Savage's manager let everyone know that wasn't the case. So there were a couple of songs that dropped here, a bunch of footage, and people started to look at the footage. People were clowning Drake a little bit, but these keep in mind, these songs didn't release officially. They just released on his IG reels and on the 100 gigs website. So everyone's thumbing through the 100 gigs website, watching all of these different videos and then more songs released. So Drake keeps updating this 100 gigs. So the songs that were released during this time, No Face, Circadian Rhythm, Red, Blue, Green. I think that was the song name. Uh, Blue, Green, Red. I just said it earlier. Blue, Green, Red. It makes me think of Red, Red Dot, Blue Dot, uh, the Young Gravy song, if you guys remember from many, many years ago. So I mentioned all of those songs, and what happens is the label is pretty much catching up. So he releases three of these in the beginning. He also released Super Soak, which was S.O.D. That was the song that Yachty had leaked to Kai Sinat, and they couldn't get it cleared because Mr. Hotspot, the social media influencer slash singer that made that song, didn't want to clear it because of the profanity, and he wanted them to get a clean version, and he said he would make sure it got cleared. That didn't end up happening, but Yachty ended up getting taken off the song. So Super Soak comes out on Drake. IG reels or on his Finsta and you could listen to the song without Yachty which was a little bit weird because it was like yo Yachty's your guy you guys have been close that was originally Yachty's whole song so why is he not on it and we thought this would get put out because my question was well this is still relatively explicit did Mr. Hotspot clear it well that song is still yet to be on streaming services but his team puts up all of these other songs Blue Green Red gets taken down from streaming services and we talked about the chart positions of these songs like some people were making excuses hey you know like, oh, it's up charted at 28. It debuted at 28, which was its peak, even though now it's at 74. You know, that's that's solid. That's what we expect Drake to chart at. The reason why I'm going to say, number one, these are flops if we're considering the actual <laughs> chart positions. We're not giving Drake any excuses here. But we, I will say that this was not his aim. Sure, the songs released a week, sometimes 10 days after the initial release on Instagram on 100 gigs website and the label catches up to distribute it make sure everything's cleared handle all the legal because he's just dropping leaking these things they got to go do all the other behind the scenes stuff to get it up as soon as possible and this is also where we start getting hints of round twos we see those different insta posts academics talks about oh round two he kind of leaks it or it doesn't leak it but he alludes to there being this round two event everyone should start to be paying attention and 
normally, which is completely standard and normal, we all think, okay, is he going to come at Kendrick again? What else could a round two possibly mean? Well, apparently it means something else, which we'll get into in a little bit. But at this point, Drake is not going anywhere. He has not disappeared. In fact, he's been putting out more than Kendrick Lamar has, which Kendrick Lamar doesn't have to do anything else right now. He won the beef. There was an album that Kendrick Lamar was getting ready to roll out, but no singles have been released from Kendrick Lamar. No, nothing other than the music video, which was the closing chapter of that beef but these songs didn't perform that well there was really no radio play behind them and i'm sure the record label had something to do with it where they're just thinking okay drake's not really trying to work these records but i think this strategy is great for drake And I'm citing myself as an example of it because one of the criticisms that Drake gets a lot of is, yo, we never seen, or Drake has a bunch of ghostwriters. People are making all of his stuff, the OVO sweatshop. And I'm raising my hand here. I'm one of those people that has levied these criticisms at Drake. And I believe they're valid criticisms. However, with this, we're seeing a lot more of Drake's recording process. And one of the moments that I loved most was seeing the trophies song being put together with him and 40. This is one of my favorite Drake songs ever. I absolutely love this song. So seeing this get put together, the behind the scenes of it, the footage, him thinking of the hook, him telling him to remove certain things, it really reminded me of my younger years because a lot of us, we grew up on Drake, whether some people were preteens, whether some people were late teens, whether some people were early 20s, maybe even mid 20s, I don't know. But I was really young when this song came out and I'm enjoying it all over again and I'm seeing him write it. So this puts these ghostwriting, a lot of this stuff puts these ghostwriting allegations at bay. They're not allegations. They're pretty much facts, but it gives Drake a lot more merit to his work because we have to be honest. One of the things that Tory Lanez did, which really cemented, also Tory Lanez is one of my favorite artists right now, which cemented him as a, yo, this guy's really, really him when it comes to this music thing is he would Instagram live stream himself writing recording, punching in, freestyling, making an entire song from scratch, even an entire mixtape from scratch. And people got to witness that process and then listen to the final product. And I think that strengthened the bond between Tory Lanez fans and Tory Lanez and made them appreciate the music that they were getting so much more and that the music that they had gotten prior, because now they're like, yo, this is what he was going through to make these songs that I love so much. Whereas a lot of these songs that we hear, we're probably like, ah, was this built in a lab? Did they just airdrop it to the person? They hop in the studio, put on the headphones, and then just recite the reference track in two takes, and then step out, take some Instagram fit pics, and go on about their day doing their club appearance for the night where they walk out for five minutes, collect the bag, go back into the tour bus, and head on to the next city. And this also is going to strengthen the bond of Drake fans I mean, Drake, keep in mind, there's always the Drake stands, which we're not talking about Aubrey's Angels. We're talking about the actual regular fans who might have been disappointed by the outcome of this beef. But it's that underground rapper feeling. It's like Drake has something to prove and not only something to prove, but he's connecting with his fans in a level that they probably haven't been able to witness since the blog days when he had the OVO blog and showing these different photos at the time or dropping these songs when he was dropping his mixtapes. So this is Connect. He's dropping these songs. The fans definitely appreciate this. Me, I personally appreciate this. We're getting more music, even though initially I didn't really like many of the songs. I didn't like that song with Lotto. It's Up was cool, but I really, really enjoy Circadian Rhythm. Like I said, I listen to that song at least twice every single day since it's dropped. No Face, that's, I I think it's a good song, but I'm not bumping it like that. So this is going to strengthen Drake's bass. He's continuously releasing. And now I don't even really think too much about the beef with Kendrick Lamar. Sure, I talk about it. But a lot of this, not just music in general, is what have you done for me lately? And Drake's doing a lot for us lately, for us that enjoy his music, or especially for the fans. Now the Kendrick Lamar, I wouldn't even say these guys are Kendrick Lamar stands or haters. The Drake haters, he could do everything right. He could be dropping amazing stuff. He could have a hit song and they would still hate on him for some reason. It's those same people that were bringing up the push a T thing over and over and over. And why I think this strategy is brilliant because you can just output away all of these fans and tire them out. Because if Drake were to take a ton of time, let's just say a couple of months, which is something that Drake wouldn't do. The expectations for a Drake comeback would be so high that I don't think he would be able to live up to them. Like him dropping a smack. If, and if the song flopped, oh my goodness, he would be getting killed after that. They would say, yo, he really put the nail in the coffin on Drake. The guy took three months off, four months off and came back with a dud. Couldn't even write up a hit. I guess the ghostwriters aren't reaching out to him anymore. You can imagine all the different comments. But if he's consistently 
throwing stuff up on Instagram, consistently dropping songs, new news coming out about him and conversations from this 100 gig stuff. It's just going to outpace the haters. Like the haters are going to be like, damn, like I can't keep up commenting on everything. And they're just going to get tired and they're just going to stop caring or stop caring as much to put in all of this effort to hate. Because a lot of this is controlling the narrative. And Kendrick Lamar is very, very good at that. But just take, for instance, this wasn't even beef related, but Dr. Dre's Detox. And there's probably another album that I can't think of off the top of my head that released and couldn't live up to the hype of how long it had been anticipated. And this strategy can work, but there's very, very strong diminishing returns on it. Some people felt that about Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. A lot of people appreciate that album now. But when that dropped, people were like, yo, he took this many years for this? And think about it. Uh, Round two, which Academics has alluded to now, being not a... Kendrick Lamar diss, although we'll probably get Kendrick Lamar subs for the foreseeable future, just like we've been getting Pusha T subs back and forth, even though Pusha T won that beef, which is, I think, another thing we'll get into after this next point. But my point here is the next big move we're probably seeing from Kendrick Lamar is the Super Bowl performance. That's the anticipation. I don't think we're going to see a song before that. We may see the album right before or right after, but I don't think there's going to be much until then. And right now it's September. Super Bowl's in a couple months, five months. So that's not too far away. But that's a lot of time for Drake to work. A lot of time for Drake to get back in people's good graces. A lot of time for people to say, man, Drake's giving us a lot right now. A lot of different moments. He might hop on a feature that goes crazy. Or he might get another hit song in the meantime. Now, if Drake's got a hit song that's topping the charts... While Kendrick's doing this whole thing with the Super Bowl, a lot of people will be like, man, we're tired of that not like us stuff. We're really not trying to hear that. Drake gave us another hit in the time that Kendrick Lamar is still trying to milk not like us. You see how that sounds? And this is coming from somebody that loved Not Like Us, but a lot of people are like, man, they're overplaying this song, which they do that for every hit song. They overplayed the hell out of God's plan, so I don't really want to hear that. But if Drake's got a new hit and Kendrick's still milking this old hit that's about Drake and Drake's moved on and got a new smash, that's an angle that really can't be ignored. And can Kendrick Lamar muster up another hit? I don't know about that one. That's not easy. I don't think Kendrick Lamar is incapable of doing that, but when you're getting ready to roll out an album and you've already got a hit that's going to last likely a year and Kendrick Lamar is more of an album artist, I don't really think it's something Kendrick Lamar would need to do. But that's an example of how the narrative can shift towards Drake's side. And hits, music, appearing on other people's hits and helping them make a hit, that's always been Drake's strongest asset. Like being in the clubs, having women listening to him, giving them captions, having relatable moments for guys too. So he just needs to lean back into that, which it seems like he's doing. Like he's just heating up. He's kindling the flame with his fans, with these different releases, getting ready to drop something. And he doesn't even have to know that he's dropping a hit. It just has to do a little bit better than everything else. Drake's team or his label team, not his insider team, they're going to run with it. And here we are. We have another one. And being able to do that for all these years is already merit in and of itself. But the ability to overcome this beef is something that he's shown, or the ability to overcome beef in general is something that he's shown with Pusha T. However, I don't like these one-to-one comparisons that people make with Pusha T and Kendrick Lamar in favor of Drake because the proportion is far different. Now, granted, what Kendrick Lamar put out about Drake is nothing new. It's just positioned in a way and catchy that it's a lot more damage to the reputation. Like being considered like the guy that goes with minors is really, 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 really bad. It's it's the worst thing that you could potentially have. Whereas with Pusha T, it was exposing that he had a son, although that was true. What Kendrick Lamar is pushing is not true. But the son thing, he was able to get over. And we also need to keep in mind that Kendrick Lamar is an A-tier or S-tier rapper in terms of commercial popularity. Pusha T, we would say, is a C-tier rapper. This is not, like, he's not, he's proportionally so far different. And Pusha T's song, Story of Adidon, was not a hit song. Like, it did what it was meant to do, but people weren't bumping that song like crazy. It wasn't topping the charts like Not Like Us. People weren't jamming to that song in the club globally, which is actually something that's happening with Not Like Us, as crazy as it is. These two things are wildly different. So whereas Drake, when he came out after the Pusha T beef and dropping hits, like Nice For nice for What, the Scorpion album, and a bunch of other different hits that were on that Scorpion album, like, I was about to say, God's Plan. Although I do think that was one of the songs on Scorpion, but I'm thinking of another one, one of my favorite ones, which is Mob Ties. Yeah, that one. And that wasn't even one of the songs that charted as crazy as uh, nonstop 
for instance. That was another hit on there. We already talked about God's plan, and we already talked about nice for what, and my feelings too. Like The guy came back with like five slappers, and many other songs on that that didn't perform, let's say, as high as these five songs that I just named, but these five songs were smashes, so there were other hits on there too. So that recovery was insane. But like I said, he didn't have to deal with a song consistently being on the charts like he has with Kendrick. Also, he wasn't beefing with too many people at that time. It was Pusha T and some beef with Kanye West. He still had his industry ties. And this is something that we've seen, which I also think is a beautiful thing that's demonstrated by the 100 Gigs Project, which might be a message that Drake is trying to show us, is he's getting tight-knit and locking back in with his core guys that he's been with since day one. He talks about you know, like no new friends, even though we see Drake with everyone, or we've seen Drake, I would say post 2014, hanging out with a lot of different people. Before that, we didn't really see Drake working with too many people that were outside of his immediate team and YMCMB. Like, yeah, he was rolling with Ross and them. But let's look at Thank Me Later, right? He had some big acts, like Alicia Keys was a feature, Nicki Minaj, YMCMB, uh, T.I. and Swizz Beats on there, Young Jeezy, like he had some features, Lil Wayne, YMCMB too. But at this time, when you think of Drake, Thank Me Later era, even Take Care, Take Care is rolling with The Weeknd, who The Weeknd was potentially going to be OVO, he was from Toronto, but he ended up doing the EXO thing. He had Nicki Minaj, Lil Wayne as features, Lil Wayne twice, so it's still a strong YMCMB core. And he was appearing on features here and there, but when you thought Drake, who's he rolling with, who's his crew, even in person, in shows, all of this stuff, it was YMCMB and the original OVO crew, like his guys, like Hush and Forty and Oliver and these other guys. Even when you go to Nothing Was The Same, which was around 2013, you had Magic Jordan, which are signed to OVO as features, uh, Janae Aiko, Detail, who really caught the, the beats, and Detail was close to Young Money for a long time. But it was 2014, I would say 2013 after this, when you saw him doing the features for Versace, and he started moving more towards, okay, I'm hanging out with a bunch of different guys now. Migos are my guys. Uh, who else? Meek at one point was his guy before the ghostwriting thing. So you start to see him chilling with all of these people. And now, or after the Pusha T beef, he didn't have beef with a lot of these different guys. What's different with this Kendrick Lamar thing, in, not only in proportion of popularity of the person he's beefing with and the song that stemmed out of the beef, the proportion of popularity being very, very high. It's the fact that now he was getting beefed with by a lot of other people and a lot of people in the industry aren't messing with him. So you've got who who was on like that. You've had Metro Boomin. You have Future. You have 21 Savage is kind of just staying out of everything. He's still cool with them, of course. But you have Travis Scott who was telling them to play that song. So we know Travis Scott isn't messing with Drake. We also have people that came out of nowhere like a Mustard. I don't think a producer can really do that much. But Future really has a stronghold in Atlanta. And do people want to, I wouldn't say cross future by working with Drake. But I feel like there's a lot of mention and static in the industry of people wanting to see Drake get taken down. And then there's Rick Ross. Who else can I think of off the top of my head? ASAP Rocky, although ASAP Rocky, Drake hasn't been rolling around with ASAP Rocky for a very, very long time. There's TDE guys. So all of these different people, they've been waiting or they're beefing with Drake now, which isn't what he had all those years ago with the Pusha T beef around six years ago. So this is also something that he has to be concerned about and him dropping this hundred gigs i think he's reminiscing like man back then i was just with the guys that i trusted and we rocked out together and i didn't have to worry about all this snaking that's going on behind my back snaking in quotes because we don't know what he did to these people i know for a fact they're not all just mad at him because he smashed some girl drake moves in a certain way for all of these people to be upset with him there's no doubt about that in my mind so it is probably deserved but this is something that's difficult to overcome. And it's a new challenge, which I think Drake invites challenge. And he's almost like this character where he's like, yes, I get to overcome a new challenge. Things have been too easy as of late. So he'll likely just continue working on his own, maybe throw some features here and there to people that he think will run up a nice hit song. But I'm more inclined to think we won't see many features from Drake for the rest of the year. Also, the industry is only going to operate for another two months. December, not much happens. So I think the strategy by Drake was the best. It, there was only a two-way street that he could take. I think taking too much time is not only out of Drake's character, outside of the history that we've had watching Drake. So it would have been an element that would have been too hard to overcome too when it comes to excelling 
surpass the expectations that people have of the song that you're going to come back with. I think this was done well. The next hit that Drake catches, there's no pressure now. If the hit pops up, it pops up. He's already dropped five songs. He's appeared on another three to four. None of them really went crazy yet. So when one does pop off, a hit is a hit. You're going to get credit for that. They're not going to say, yo, you needed to fire off 15 times to catch a number one. They're just going to say, nah, we, we got this number one. Unless you're a super hater, which that is not me. He's weathered a storm before, even though this storm is more like a hurricane than the last one, which was a torrential rainstorm. So Drake, I think he's just going to keep moving the way he's moving. I'm enjoying what's happening as of late. Like that trophies, man, that trophies coverage or footage really, really won me over. Not in any particular way, but it got me appreciating what's going on right now. And really, the best reply to Kendrick Lamar's Super Bowl performance would be to already have a hit. That would do all the speaking. He wouldn't even need to drop anything, say anything, throw any particular sub. That would do everything for him. But let me know what you guys think about this in the comments. Am I tripping? Let me know if I am. What do you think about Drake's 100 gigs and dropping these songs? Do you appreciate it? What are What's your favorite song that dropped out of these five? Let me know in the comments. Like and subscribe and hit the notification bell if you enjoyed. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you for watching. Peace.